And machine tools, like this is this is actually the Harford's Ferry right here. They still make muskets there, kind of to show how it was done. And this is an auger, and we drill out the hole for the barrels. And it's powered by water power, so it turns a big wheel, which turns these belts. This is a lake that does the stock. And who makes the most the best machine tools in the world today? What country? Us. Japan. Good guess, no. Japan, good guess. They make some, but no. That's a really good guess, but no. Germany. Germany. Germany does. That's why Germany is the largest net exporting country in the world. Because these machine tools are so incredibly valuable. China makes a lot of the manufactured goods, but they get their most of their machine tools from a few from America, some from Japan, but most from Germany. Germany makes the best. And they are incredibly valuable, incredibly expensive. And so robots are an example of this. But there's something you must know. A machine, you've just replaced oh, a skilled worker. That's, you replace workers. And so this is an issue. What if you have workers who are willing to do it? What if they don't want to lose their skill? Yeah. Someone has to build the machine. And so yeah, and so eventually you have this weird kind of situation where you have machines build the machines, right? Yeah, we, we, we can just keep going in circles. But yeah, that's basically what it is. I mean, you got to start somewhere, but yeah, in the whole process. But you would have people, but the people who build them, a lot of times they'll be using machines to build the machines, which is what we have today. And next, and once we have that, now we can have the factory system, which fits in an interchangeable parts. Factory is a term that comes from India, and basically it was a big warehouse. And so when the Europeans got there, they would they would trade at the warehouse. Well, it doesn't make sense. A big warehouse is to store goods. Use the same word for a big warehouse to store machine tools. So it's all the production under one roof. There's a factory. There's inside the factory. And we hear this. It makes sense to our ears because we you just produce it in one place. But before you had machines doing the work, why would you need one place? People could do the work at home. That's where they did it. Production was done at home, called cottage industry. But here, no. Now it's all under one roof. There's a logic to it, but it's now not going to be somebody at home. They own their home. They're independent. Now it's one person or entity owns the factory. You know, as I said, entity. What do I mean by entity? Yes, reptoids. <laughs> Do I know? Hmm? Corporations. Corporations. Yeah, corporations. Because corporations aren't people. Oh, yeah, they have all the rights in war. They have much more rights than people. But we have a progressive country. But it's an entity, create, a legal entity that's created to, to create big business. Well, what we have, therefore, then, is this concept of Capital and capital, you know what capital is? You better know. Yeah. Hmm? That's what I was thinking. Okay. <laughs> capital, yes. A lot of people say capital, they think, yeah. Um, isn't capital money put forth by someone as an investment? Actually, when you hear that, and that's a shorthand that people use, but it's actually not correct because you need money to buy capital. So a lot of times they have capital investments money, but it's it, the money is used to buy the capital. So a lot of times people put it together. So that's a shorthand that people use a capital investment, but money you buy. So you're on the right track. It's called the means of production. That's capital. Capital, the means of production. You have to know this. That's capital. So the so as James said, you have the money, now you can buy or you get a loan. That's the big thing. You buy the machine tools, you buy the building, you buy the land it's on, the fuel, the transportation, the distribution, all of that is capital. A capital investment is buying the capital, the means of production. That's why capitalism in reality, it did not exist until the Industrial Revolution. Because before, who did the work? People and their hands. 
Now it's machine. I mean, not like overnight, 1850 happened, all of a sudden machines are doing everything. But that's the beginning of the world. And I went through all those things. You know, fuel would be one of the most expensive forms of capital, for example. What's not capital? These guys. Labor is not capital. But what a different world. Before, people made stuff with their hands at home. Now, they can't. They got to go someplace and work. And just think how important the factory system is now today. Things that we, they make today can't be made at home. In fact, virtually nothing can be made at home anymore. We go make a car at home. Now I'm going to go make a car. Well, first I'll stop at the iron mine. I'll get I'll dig a quick hole, get some iron, <sighs> get the blast furnace going, make some steel. Can't be done for anything. In fact, can anything come up with something that is homemade? Food. I mean, really? Where do you get the seeds? Who did you grow before? Huh? Who did you grow before that? Who has done that? Anybody? You did that with seeds you grew before? Yeah. How many things? Right. Yeah, potatoes, you cut the eyes off. Okay, got one. Whatever there's an eye, you know, you cut, boom, drop it in, you get a clone. Yeah. Hold on. You so you have sheep and well, llamas. My you do it for llamas? My, 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 my grandpa had a llama farm for a long time. And he did it, he, he made textiles at home. Really? I mean, that's really yeah, hard work. That's impressive. Yeah. I think we now we've got two examples. We got potatoes and llamas. <laughs> <laughs> Not really good. How the point is. It's almost impossible, right? I mean, even then, you think you think you're making it home, you have to get the components from someplace else. Yeah, there's very a couple food things, but even then, I mean, what a different world is where before, remember, they pretty much had to do everything on their own. It's a different world. Factories would change everything. And so, now we get textiles and new All these things kind of built up as once. The textile industry started before the transportation in reality, but then it exploded. And Mrs. Hargrave's power loom, thread would be here, and the thread would go up to this, be spun into these loom, and while they did it, they basically constantly would be making kind of a line of cloth, and they push this little thing forward and make kind of a cloth as they go. It's, it's hard to show unless you see it, but cloth would come out right here. And it's a dangerous work, hard work, but powered by water power. Cloth could be made, and it's a pretty remarkable thing. And these spindles would move incredibly fast, be very dangerous. And how did it get there, though? Britain did everything it could to try to make sure that their secrets did not leave. They made it against the law to take out the blueprints for some of their factories. But in the 1790s, Samuel Slater, who was who um, was essentially a foreman. At one of these factories in, in Scotland, Scott, there was a lot of textile mills in Scotland because there was fast moving streams, a lot of mountains. He remembered that and he memorized the entire factory, the whole thing, and brought it to New England. Why New England? Why uh, Massachusetts? Lots of low mountains, valleys, fast moving streams. Fast moving streams that turn the water off. That tells you a lot about Samuel Slater, though. A couple of things about it. First off, he must have just had a remarkable memory. Because these are incredibly complex things. And so he clearly had one of those just memories that was kind of frightening. Or if, it's one, if one of your friends has a memory like that, you hate them. <laughs> you know, and he's like, how do you know all this? Doesn't mean you're smart, but boy, it's nice having that memory. And the other thing yeah. is, and this is just something the way it is. In the 1790s, people had significantly better memories than people today. Like maybe five or 6,000 percent better. And before the printing press, people had significantly better memories than people in the 1790s. Every technological improvement, people lose a little bit of memory and then intelligence. They get dumber. And so, this is true. I have a better memory than you. Let me rephrase that. I had a better memory when I was your age than you do now. I'm old now, so I don't even know what class this is. But, <laughs> and that really is true. It's not saying I'm smarter, but I just, 
I didn't have the tools, and so I had to know more. Just it's the way it was. I had to know more. And now, even though you should know more, it, it the, you, there are shortcuts where you don't need to know as much. And when you don't know as much, you have, you have it in your long term memory. You just don't know as much. It's hard to pull it back. You always got to be looking things up. And if you're looking things up, you don't believe really thinking about it, you're just looking things up. And so, and then I guarantee it, when I was your age, my teachers had better memories than me, and so on. And that really is part, and the only, I think, legitimate part of that, when you get curmudgeony old men like me, and then they say to, you know, people, you know, these kids need this. Well, there is one element of truth, if I have better memories. But, no, be afraid of that. Because you always seem to remember things being a lot harder for them. <laughs> but, but other than that, no, there's no other difference. But I think that's the only reason there's a little bit of legitimacy to that. You would not have believed how tough I am. I think I told you, didn't I? Uphill every day, frozen gator infested swamp. <laughs> lived at the bottom of the lake. That's where I lived. That's the place we could afford. <laughs> so, what they use is water power. This is actually built right on the stream, and you get these fast moving streams and the wheels just behind. This and it would turn the wheel, and then at the end of the day, you lift the wheel up and the power is gone. A lot of times they would flood it, or I'm sorry, flood it, damn it, and then use a sluice that could concentrate the water to one source. Water power is good, but there's a problem with water floods, droughts, ice. What if someone upriver floods it or uses up all the water? Your know, water is an inconsistent power source, but once you have it, because in New England, the power, the power looms began. And there's something else. You notice we had New England. By the 1830s, they're doing cotton, which is in the South. But the textile mills didn't happen there. And the most important reason was the immediate one. It's flatter where the cotton is. Slow moving, meandering streams are not good for mills. That's why it's in New England. And a little bit New York, Connecticut, but New England had the best. Same reason why we have dams all over western Montana. Granite with granite sides, mountain valleys, fast moving rivers, you gotta have speed to turn the turbines. That's why they're here. That's why you don't see a lot of you see some irrigation, but not a lot of power dams in let's say Iowa. That's why. So that's New England. This is by 1850. And all of these places are textile mills. Lowell was the biggest. Three streams right into Lowell. Perfect. And Lowell would become one of the most important, in fact, the prototype for factories in the United States. In fact, it's going to be called the Lowell system. That is Lowell. Now, this is by the time they had steam, too. But think about it. Okay, before, people did things at home, and they're at home. But now, if an investor, whatever, a person builds a factory, they want to make sure that all the workers come at the same time, work at the same time, People don't just say, i got to go eat and take off. No. Eat at the same time, take a break at the same time, go to the bathroom at the same time, leave work at the same time. They want it all regimented. That's a big change than before. A big change. Now, we hear that say, yeah, that's what work is. And I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. That's work. You, you do what they say. No, people don't want to be told, what, especially men, don't tell me what to do. They were socialized to be independent. Well, not only that, they didn't want them leaving work and doing things like drinking all night or other things, so the next morning they couldn't work. And so the factories wanted to control their entire life. Pretty much from when they started working every moment until they're told to work and they kick them off into the streets, which is what happened. They called this the law system and every factory is going to do this in some way. And all of you are being trained to be like this. And so, they would do it, and who would they get? Well, men in the 1830s, uh, they would fight this. Young women, 15 to maybe 25. There's a lot of reasons why young women. Part of the reason was smaller hands. Let me go to this picture right here. They had the hands that could reach in between these spindles and put in the thread. Men have a little bit bigger hands, and they didn't want to slow up to stop it. 
stop the um, oh my God. stop it so they can uh, you know lift, get rid of the power source and you reach your hand into the loom. And so while it's still whirling, they can stick their hand and get a snag, which happened all the time. And of course, if that thread wraps around the finger, gone. And they're fired. Immediately. And so this is really dangerous work. So that's part of it. But the other reason why young women, what are women taught? Let's look at this picture again. Who's in charge? There's no doubt, right? There's no doubt he's in charge. Not just because it's 1830, you assume a man would be in charge, but also just if you saw this today with people today, yeah, he's clearly in charge. Women were taught from day one. How are they supposed to treat men? What? Yeah, respect, be subservient, exactly right, obey men. That's what women were taught to do. Women were taught to obey. Women were taught to do what they were told. Men, they were taught that way. That's socialized. And by the way, this will perpetuate the socialization. And yes, it is significantly different today, but there's no doubt that socialized, when it comes to socializing young people today, girls are much more apt to obey, follow directions than, than boys are. And that is true. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I mean, I look at honors classes today, and I have about 65% girls in my class. Some years I've had as high as 75%. And so clearly that's, in college, more, there's more girls and young women in college today than there are boys. So there's a clear negative to that. So I guess part of that socialization means girls are smarter. Now I don't necessarily believe that, but it seems to be true, at least on this side of the room. I know you guys didn't say anything, so it must be true. And now you feel bad about being on this side. <laughs> No, clearly, neither true, but it's so it's not socialized. But women obey. Women obey. Now, how are they going to get young men to accept this? That will be much harder. It will be much harder for a while. Then they'll find the way to beat the independence out of them. So, labor unions. We that's that could be the place where the first labor unions would begin. Because women would be so horribly mistreated at these places, they would start some of the first unit unions for better working conditions, better treatment. Wages are usually not the most important thing unions fight for. It's more control. Because at the workplace, the employer wants 100% control, and people are, are expected to give up their freedom when they go work for somebody else. I am in a union. And the union law before me has negotiated certain things that I can, and I they can't make me do. You know, so they can't say to me, you got to come back at 5 o'clock and do this for the school. They can't make me do that. Now, they can say you're going to go to a meeting at 2. You know those awful meetings? I, I mean, those wonderful meetings, camera. Those wonderful <laughs> meetings we have on Monday. That's why it's during school time, and you, and you have shortened days. Oh yeah, I'm recording this right now. <laughs> this is going coast to coast. So, one more thing. Look at this. This is this is awesome. That's scary. They have the timetable of what they want the workers to do. The bells, when they would get up, in fact, they had dormitories for these young women. Five, six women in one small room, they'd all have to get up together, they go to breakfast together. They go to work together, they eat lunch together, they go home together, and then after work, they'd have things for them to do, to do together. They would not let them date or see other people, and they ever got married or fired immediately, which was pretty normal up to the 1970s. In fact, it's still an issue. Uh, one of the reasons women are denied promotion to this day is because, well, they're going to get pregnant. They won't, they won't work hard. That's all the time, to this day. Um... Yeah, that was even used in the uh, presidential debate. Because one of the two candidates said that. Yeah, yeah, they're just going to get pregnant. That's a real problem for workers, or for employers. Yeah, that probably wouldn't be Clinton. <laughs> you know, I mean, she better that out. Yeah, Trump said that. But, the bells. So, steam power. Steam power is next. Because once you have these factories, now you need a more consistent power source. And when you have steam, you need iron and coal. Middle Atlantic? 
the middle Atlantic is kind of an awkward way of saying kind of the middle of the Atlantic coastline. So we're talking New York, Pennsylvania. And that's why you get cities like Syracuse or Pittsburgh, because they're near coal and iron. And that's an iron mill in, in uh, Philadelphia. These are coal miners. You're going to see all ages in there. Young boys were good. The poor mules will never see the light of day. These are breaker boys breaking up the coal with their feet. It's hard to get a more hard to even imagine a more awful job. I know the first twelve hours would be fine, but no, you do all day, and also with their hands. If they fall in, they're just mangled and then of course fired. If you think about workers, you know, he writes to have a worker's top. Workers had to fight very, 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 very hard for that. The laws that protect workers, they were just kind of bestowed on them. Here's a gift for you, because we like you. No. Same thing with health insurance or vacations, crazy thing has weekends. Workers had to fight really hard for those. But James Watt would invent the steam engine. Now, it's from Britain. Watt perfected, there's actually a pump. This came from a pump that pumped water out of the new coal mines called the Nukuman engine. Watt perfected it. Now, the point was the ancient Greeks and the Chinese, heck, it was in India too, they had steam engines I mean, a couple thousand years before this, but there's no reason for them. It's kind of a toy. But now they go into demand, they need it, innovation can go off because they need a power source. And basically, came up with a better way for this piston to work, and now engines work on this basic design. And using steam, you can turn a wheel, and once you have that, that powers a factory, a steamboat, rail. That's a the, one of his original engine, they called him an engine, in, in Edinburgh, Scotland. And it's a really cool museum because it had this. And that was really cool. <clears throat> That's a little steam-powered car that Watt tried to make. He actually made a couple of them, but they had a bad tendency to blow up. I think you can see why this cylinder would be full, full of steam, you know, 220 degrees, and these rivets would start to rust, and then all of a sudden one would go, and then you need a new car. And it would only go on like about a mile, and I guess it would be awful, but still pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that, that's going to be some high rates for that insurance. I would not recommend getting this. Yeah, I get one, huh? You, show you have guts. Seven, once you have power swords, once you have the need for various things, it will feel innovation on top of innovation. And so it wasn't that all of a sudden in the 19th century people got smart. It's that they were developed or these um, inventions were needed. Eli Whitney, also probably stealing it like the interchangeable parts, that's the cotton gin. That would make cotton production faster. I'll talk more about that later. So we're just going this fast. Elias Howe. Once we have textiles, what's that? Yeah, Elias Howe invented the first sewing machine. And sewing machines today still use the same basic process as that. It's pretty remarkable. That's a brilliant design. It really is. Samuel Morris, what's that? What the what? Well, he, the code for the telephone. He actually didn't invent the telegraph, but he invented the code, so now it's usable. And so now think about railroads need this communication. And all it's in is a tiny little electrical charge down the line. And he was one who came up, okay, with little earphones, you can pick up like a tiny bit of static. So long bits of static called dash, short bits of static, a dot. Now you have a code. And he would, and so he came up with all these letters, and then the early telegraphs, back for the first 50 years of it, there had to be a station every 30 miles because it could only, the range was only about that far. So 24 hours a day, there would be someone there just listening. And they would do like a bunch of dots in a row to like, you know, a message is coming. Then you'd have to write it down, then you send it to the next station. So if you ever played, when I was a kid, it was called telegraph, but I think it's called telephone today, you know, the guy I'm talking about. That's where it comes from, because you get some pretty wild messages. I know a couple companies went bankrupt because it's not the, the message got all garbled because of the stations. And SOS, that's where it comes from. SOS, all it mean, all they were is two letters that are very easy to hear. Three dots, three dashes, three dots. 
So that became the international distress symbol because of Morse code. SOS doesn't mean anything. It's just for code. And then people said, uh, you know, save our souls and stuff like that. No, I had nothing to do with that. It was just because of Morse code. Two more big innovations we have to get to. The steel tip plow by John Deere. Now you have a plow that could cut through the hard Midwestern soil, soil and not lose its tip. This is the plow, a more modern one. You'd ride here, pull back horses up here. And then Cyrus McCormick. McCormick would make the mechanical reaper. The mechanical reaper. Got that, Max? The mechanical reaper and John Deere's steel tip plow. And this would do the work of 10, soon to be 20 people, pulled by horse, horses, you know what a combine is, it does what a combine is. In fact, it uses the same basic thing. It cuts down, in this context, wheat, and then it gets in here and it kind of spins the wheat, and that knocks the, what they would literally call corn off, the little wheat. That's what it does. Is this good for small farmers or bad? Uh, yeah, it's, it seemed good at first, doesn't it? It's going to kill them. Mechanization will destroy them. Well, that leads us to why in the U.S.? Why do we have an American system here? Why? And I chose that picture because it's iron bullets. It's just amazing. We had the resources. Well, we'll get to it. You're exactly right. The first thing is demand. And Victor's right. That's going to be the second one. First one, we have more middle class people than anybody else. Now, at that time, it was about 10% of the population. Remember, these are people... They have to work, but they can afford some of the upper class lifestyle. But we also, railroads. So much demand from railroads. Don't worry about interchangeable parts. I have no idea how, even how that got there. But shortage of labor. If you don't have a lot of workers, machines make sense. And if you don't have a lot of skilled craftsmen, there won't be as many people complaining about machines taking their jobs. So France which was very technically advanced in the 1790s, had a surplus of workers. So they were behind in making machines and actually would never really catch up. And this would hurt them all the way through World War I and World War II. Next, capital. And that's what Victor said. We talked about the resources. We have the fuel, and that's the big. We have fast moving streams, wood, coal, and then at the end, the next, going into the next century, oil. You have a lot of it, the price is low. And then the last thing, education. Mont Montana. <laughs> Montana has very good education system. We do much better in other places, but we weren't around yet. The United States had the most literate population in the world. The literacy rate in the Northeast for men was over 97%. Man, that's so basic literacy, but it's remarkably high. In the South, there's about 70% for white men, which are still higher than any place else in the world. If you count the slaves, it drops down to about 40%. Women in the North were at 70%. And that is really high. Literacy will give you two things. It's not so much what you learn in here, but think about for industrialization. Education teaches you to adapt. You can adapt to change much easier than someone who does have those skills. You can go to this class and learn something, go to another class and learn something. Boy, it's almost like it's planned that way, isn't it? You can learn things, adapt, adapt to change. But there's one more thing, so everyone put down, adapt, and the next one is really important. And I've already hinted at it. You're also taught to obey. That's how they got men to do this. From day one of school, what are you taught? When the bells ring, you go to school, don't you? You're punished if you're tardy, wait. The bell rang now, and you can leave, right? But you still obey, don't you? You stay. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding about that. Actually, if I was serious, about, you know, I would have that joke. To, no, way, I'm done. You all would have. I know Victor's going to do that. He's going to act like that. He's some kind of rebel. No, wait a second. I'm at the serious part. Right. And so, every moment you're in school, you are manipulated to be good little happy. <laughs> huh? oh, of course they would. I know they're going to be like rebels. I'll show him. No, no, you're not. Yeah. And actually, actually, you know, that shows that same. If they just run because I said you got the paper attack, that's also a lack of free will. Because you're doing what they're talking 
Yep. Yeah. All like the robots off to the next period. You know, I work all day, and then and then a life is skipped. <laughs> Where were you? Oh, you were uh, sick. No, wait a minute. Are your parents gone? And they left you all alone with the beasties? 